Hi, welcome back to Monarchist Propaganda for Women. Listen, in the quest for finding bizarre royal family biographies, I have learned that the newer they are, the weirder they are. As the new royal PR tries to dance around all of the old PR, I have hit the jackpot today. This is the new royal family, Prince George, William, and Kate by Robert Jobson. The title itself raises some eyebrows. Robert Jobson is a British journalist who, surprise, surprise, has written a lot of royal biographies, including two co-authored pieces with Ken Worf, who was Diana's former bodyguard, and we do not have time to get into him. He's now like a royal commentator in his own right. He has written a lot of books about Prince Charles and Prince Philip, and the rabbit hole goes down deep. But he's tried his hands at some new mascots. And as you should know by now, the introductions of these royal biographies go in some pretty psychotic directions. We are literally at the beginning. The birth of any baby is always special, a moment of undiluted joy and celebration. But the birth of a future sovereign is extra special. Why? An historic point in time for Britain and the rest of the Commonwealth to savor. The birth marks a new beginning for a new royal family. And it's always italicized in the book. I don't know why. Born into a multimedia age, Prince George will have to adapt to a fast-changing world perhaps like no other future monarch. Yeah, think about all the invasions of privacy that have happened to Charles and William and Harry, and they didn't live in a time with Twitter. Like, they didn't have the internet. And now Prince George has to live through that media scrutiny. And one day reign over a new, more streamlined, modern monarchy not to mention an increasingly diverse population. This book celebrates this highly significant moment in our history and attempts to shed light on the story behind the headlines. I feel like I read something dirty. This is a child. I feel like I'm being asked to consent to the idea of Prince George being allowed to grow up in a new media type environment that is unsafe for any child, especially for a child of his public status. And then we learn that the book has been illustrated by a man that has a, quote, good working relationship with members of the royal family. He has an MBE, so you know it's true. We then get the lie that Prince George is going to be a, quote, modern monarch because he, quote, is descended from coal miners as well as kings, which is just like, not, not true, really. The Middletons are way too far removed from coal miners. It might as well say that he's the first black king, you know? One day, this child will lead a very different monarchy. One that is more streamlined, inclusive, and more cost-effective. Even when they have a monarch on the throne, they are always trying to get you invested in the next model, the next upgrade. It's like every time you get an iPhone, they tell you that the next one's going to be even better. Do you remember that other bizarrely sinister line in another Prince William biography where it's like, oh, poor Prince Charles. People don't want a monarchy anymore. All they care about is value for money. I mean, yes, that's what happens when most people don't have a lot of money. This is them just trying to assuage us that one day the monarchy is going to be value for money. But listen, they are billionaires. No billionaire is value for money. There is no person on this earth that I can think of that is worth a billion dollars. I don't mean what's in their bank account. I mean, like, they are so crucial to the earth that we need to give them a billion dollars. In the modern global media world, this child will be watched like no other. Something George's parents will be acutely mindful of. If this child was simply the heir to the throne, that would be enough to retain the interest of the watching world. But that is not all George is. For the first time in history, this first baby would have become sovereign, irrespective of sex. Firstly, so much of that is like so bleak and dark and depressing and sad to think about a child being like scrutinized by like Twitter people for the rest of his life. But also it's so sad because we see that the PR 
was really excited for this idea of really like boosting the modern monarchy angle by making this law change. They really wanted to push this idea of like, oh my God, we're so modern. Like whoever, whatever sex the baby is, like they could be the next monarch. I think honestly, they were kind of disappointed that Prince George was born a boy. If he had been born a girl, they would be hyping that up for decades. Trying to get us hyped up for the next queen. Because in their mind, the queen sells. They really market themselves to women because of the whole like fairy tale angle of everything. So like men aren't really invested in the monarchy. And women who are invested in the monarchy, they don't want a king. Like they hate men. Men just suck for the monarchy. Like women do not stand kings. Especially men who are cheaters and liars. So one, we get this uh, weird interlude where we learned that um, William and Harry were spanked as children, which is really sad actually. Doesn't sound very modern, just sounds like abuse. Whiplash back to the present, or like 2014, whenever this book is. And we learn about how Wills and Kate are kind of branding themselves as just William, just Kate. Like, they want to be easy breezy, super chic. So modern. But shocking transition. We're told that as Queen Elizabeth is aging, Prince Charles is becoming the Shadow King. This is a fucking ancient maneuver. Was Charles literally usurping the throne from an old lady? Maybe not just him, like his cronies as well. But seriously, this guy took power from his own mother in his own sort of shadow court? They make this sound like no big deal, but if you've studied history, like you know that this is a bad sign, right? Like this is not how the monarchy is supposed to work. It's so interesting that old lady queen was like this vision of like Britain. But this book in 2014 is trying to make us accept that Charles has been like secretly the king the whole time. Sounds like elder abuse, but this is also an interesting part here where they start talking about how basically the PR of the family envisioned their use for Prince Harry going forward. Despite his PR slips in Las Vegas, royal advisors believed Prince Harry too had a key role to play his improving reputation would survive the exposure. Successful Jubilee visits to Jamaica and Brazil in 2012, followed by an equally positive USA tour in 2013, confirmed his star quality as a roving royal. He may be risque, but like his late mother Diana, he certainly has the wow factor. Based on this description, they would have basically made Harry play the role of like, the bad boy for the rest of his life. Despite him, you know, not actually being one, at least no more than William. But despite being trash in the media, they needed Prince Harry because he had the wow factor. People actually liked him because he was charismatic and interesting. Seems like a kind of bad deal for Prince Harry, and Prince Harry agrees with me. But whiplash, we get another example of Charles getting ready to become king when he's not actually king. The queen took the opportunity to discuss how to handle this important reshaping of the monarchy with her heir, Prince Charles. It is a delicate situation, and one of which the Prince of Wales in particular is mindful. He is ready to do whatever Her Majesty requires of him. The transition will be imperceptibly gradual, tightly managed, and no doubt entirely orchestrated by the queen herself. She knows that even if they come across as a little dull, we like our royal family to appear calm, composed, and in control at all times. That whole statement was like a big, what, what the hell was that? Hello, and welcome back to Monarchy's Propaganda for Women. We are continuing our journey through The New Royal Family by Robert Jobson, written as official PR for the family, or as close to official as you can get. We're starting today with the topic of the Commonwealth. Now, the subject of the royal family and the Commonwealth and slavery and all that history of exploitation, you know, it's a pretty nuanced, difficult conversation to have, but not for Robert Jobson, apparently. The Commonwealth has been one of the greatest successes of Her Majesty's reign. It is not an organization on a mission. As Her Majesty has said, 
Instead, it offers its 2.1 billion people the unique opportunity to work together to achieve solutions to a wide range of problems. That was a PR word salad. They might as well have said synergy in there. How are all those solutions going to these complex problems? Has the royal family done anything for these Commonwealth nations to aid in poverty, to aid in homelessness, to aid in food insecurities? Like, what have they actually done for that? And the answer is nothing. But it claims that the Commonwealth is, quote, central to her role as a modern monarch. And close sources say she believes it is at the heart of the new royal family. No explanation whatsoever. What about the Commonwealth is modern? They're just using the word modern. They really want to paint this book as talking about the new royal family, the modern monarchy. But what about the Commonwealth is modern? It, it's just a reskinning of the same empire from hundreds of years ago. And yet again, we get this mention of Prince Charles being the Shadow King. Again, why would they want to put this in print? This is not a good sign for the monarchy. You don't want to have a shadow court in your kingdom. They think somebody usurping the throne from an aging woman is a modern concept? Because it's not. It is for the younger generation to take up the torch, particularly when it comes to the Commonwealth and international diplomacy, which after all is at the core of what modern monarchy is about. You know it's propaganda when they keep repeating the same words over and over again, but don't actually give a reasoning for their claim. The claim is that the Commonwealth is new and modern and a big part of where the PR should be going in the future. But where is the evidence and reasoning to show that that's modern or what modern people want, what the younger generation wants? I don't want this. I don't think people younger than me want this. Just some scary facts for you if you're an anti-monarchist like myself. Under her stewardship, the Commonwealth has grown into a voluntary association of 54 independent countries spanning six continents, about 30% of the world's population, with half under 25 years of age. Actually, that last bit might be like a little bit of a relief for an anti-monarchist like myself, because younger people tend to understand that the monarchy is a grift and we shouldn't have it anymore. Think about the royal family is claiming that they are the heads of state, the leaders of 30% of the world. 30% of the world. Why? Why in the modern era? But then we get something kind of interesting, honestly. It goes on to say, quote, There is no hard and fast rule stipulating that a British monarch should be head of the Commonwealth. Therefore, there is no guarantee that Prince Charles or his heirs and successors, as the rules stand, will succeed Her Majesty in this crucial role. Where was this when the Queen died? Did anyone stand up and say, hey, apparently there's no official rule that the head of the Commonwealth has to be the monarch? Nope, we just manufactured consent for Charles to take that title, I guess. In 2013, some senior figures and officials in the organization have publicly cast doubt on whether the Prince of Wales should succeed the Queen, arguing that the next head should be selected from one of the other member states of the Commonwealth as to shake off its colonial past. Makes a lot of sense. They mention this idea even of like Nelson Mandela taking on this title. And you know what? This would actually be kind of a cool idea. If they want to keep this idea of the Commonwealth, but change who the head is so it's not a monarch anymore, that could actually be a cool idea. But it seems like we forgot this whole thing in the past decade. This next part is also really interesting considering all the talk in recent media about how host countries for these royal engagements aren't really interested in footing the bill anymore because it's freaking expensive. It costs serious money, a tab picked up by the host government. This fact is not lost on the host media who at times have been known to forget that the royals are not celebrities, but in fact, their next king and queen. The royal family really wants to live in this like gray space where their PR treats them like celebrities. They perform like a celebrity family. They are essentially the Kardashians and how they engage with PR and spin. But then they wanna go, how dare these host countries 
get all worked up about the cost of bringing these people in. They forget their place. They forget that these people are special. They're the king and queen. They're not just some celebrities. That respect kind of has to be earned now. You don't get to just deserve respect for being the king and queen in the modern era. If you want to be a modern monarchy, you have to earn that respect. You can't just be mad that these countries are mad at you for wasting their fucking taxpayer money on giving you a vacation. And another part of the book, which I think is really interesting because I think it it's pretty true. There's a quiet, irrational belief among us all that the queen will just go on and on indefinitely. But both she and her devoted consort, the Duke of Edinburgh, are realists. They've acknowledged that their advancing years will inevitably force them to slow down. There is no question whatsoever of her abdicating like the Dutch queen Beatrix, who stepped down in favor of her son in 2013. Clearly, however, as she approached her 90th year, the queen had set the wheels in motion for the significant adjustments that needed to be made. All sorts of interesting ideas, but no questioning of some of the core concepts presented in the text. One, why won't Queen Elizabeth abdicate? It's interesting that the books devote so much time on this idea that Prince Charles is the Shadow King. He's taking over for her. There is a changing of the guards, as this title suggests for the chapter. But the Queen won't step down and abdicate and let him be king. Why? Why is that? Is it because Charles is a shitty person and nobody wants to be him to be king? Probably. What good is it for her to remain on the throne if she's claiming here that her advancing years will inevitably force her to slow down? What's the purpose of keeping that title? It sounds like it's mostly for marketing purposes and has nothing to do with the actual power structure of the institution. Let Prince Charles rule the family from behind the screen, lurking in the shadows, but don't actually abdicate to give him the title? that he's apparently already taken on in secret? Like, the, the whole thing is so untransparent, it's really bad. When I asked Prince Andrew if it wouldn't be better for the queen to be free to retire as she gets older, he smiled and said, but that's the nature of monarchy. It's as simple as that. I don't think it's even a thought. Again, the, the, not questioning at all. That's the nature of the monarchy. Why? Why is that the nature of the monarchy? You just told me about a monarch that abdicated and let her son take over, Queen Beatrix. Even better question, why do we need a monarchy? <laughs> Anybody? But now we get into the idea of the sort of like PR hopes for the family. Here's where they want to go into the future. Quote, however, a new royal family is taking the reins, and although for now Prince Charles will take the lead, there can be no doubt about who the star couple will be. From now, the focus will be on William and Kate, who have become international stars in their own right. This book was written in 2014, uh, and in just a few short years, apparently that wasn't the case anymore. They were not the big celebrities of the family. And we know how that turned out. Stay tuned for Wills and Kate. Let's talk about future king and queen of the Commonwealth, Prince William and Kate. If you've been following my series on the new royal family by Robert Jobson, you know that the purpose of this book is to introduce us to the modern monarchy. What is the monarchy going to look like in the future? And here's how we're introduced to the relationship of William and Kate. It opens on their wedding, of course, because the monarchy is always about sharing this idea of the big fairy tale wedding with their female audience. He writes, quote, They kiss not once, but twice, to the delight of the million-strong crowd tightly packed along the mall opposite Buckingham Palace. Minutes later, World War II fighter planes roared overhead and the fly passed. It was all timed to military precision. The Buckingham Palace publicity machine could not have asked for anything better during the royal couple's first public appearance as man and wife. But this was not just a kiss for the cameras. This was true love. It never ceases to amaze me that these royal biographers never write like a normal person. They are always focused on the publicity machine, on the perfect PR for the family and not about actually talking about the family as if they are normal people. The kiss was a wonderful touch, 
an iconic moment in the history of this new modern monarchy, and everyone there could feel something special was beginning. It doesn't explain anything about what makes this kiss such a big part of the modern monarchy. Like, people have kissed at their weddings in the past. Like, there's nothing about this monarchy that is new. But again, they're always looking to get you interested in the next king, in the next monarch, and how it's going to be so new, so different, so modern. But they're doing exactly the same shit that they've always been doing. We've talked in the past on my channel about how I don't like this idea of Catherine being a commoner. She definitely was not one, but it gets regurgitated here. And with that, the one-time commoner, Catherine, in an instant, took the giant step into the magical world of royalty, destined now to be the future queen consort of 16 countries across the globe. Together, William and Catherine erased the sadness of our recent royal past and evoked memories of happier times when we still believed in fairy tale royal marriages. They've given the game away. That's exactly what it's about. It's about trying to make us believe in the fairy tale again. We don't believe in it because we've heard all of these behind the scenes stories taking place that show that it's not a fairy tale. It's not this magical place, but this idea that their wedding made us believe again and tried to erase some of that bad past, that bad PR that they've gotten from like Charles and Diana, for example. At last, the royal family could move on from the tragic circumstances surrounding her death. And now finally, the icon of Princess Diana is able to rest in peace. Yeah, sure. This was quite simply a very good day for both royalists and for the House of Windsor. Not for those Commonwealth countries, which is what we were talking about in the previous section, but sure, for the Royalists, for the House of Windsor, it was a good day, it was good PR. This quote here is really interesting to me because I think it sums up how the royal family thinks of these royal marriages, which is hilarious because it's from a Victorian journalist over a hundred years ago. Walter Badgett, the brilliant Victorian journalist and constitutional expert, that's an interesting title, was right all those years ago. A princely marriage really does rivet mankind. For this was our, the people's wedding too, and we were all happy to be a part of it. And I think it makes perfect sense that the family takes these weddings and royal marriages very seriously. They know it's an excuse for great PR, to try to involve people in the spectacle, to try to get people emotionally invested in the fairy tale angle. And when they can convince people that this is the people's wedding, then they can try to convince people that the monarchy is a part of their lives, that the monarchy is doing something for them when it's really not. Also, again, remember when I said that they always put the new royal family in italics? It's like, this just looks like pure PR when you do things like that. It might as well have a trademark after it. The book starts to flash back to Kate Middleton's childhood and it's interesting because I read another royal biography that made this exact same comparison to Prince William as a teenager and Leonardo DiCaprio. Again, I don't know why they've chosen exactly the same celebrity to make this comparison, but I would not say that the sort of fervor of Leonardo DiCaprio fans and Prince William fans was ever equivalent. But they also put in the book, and again, I don't understand why they would do this if this is meant to be positive PR for them, but they mentioned that Kate Middleton really fancied William, that she had posters of him on their her wall. And it just like, the alarm bells start ringing in my head, right? This is like a major power imbalance between the two of them. One of her roommates, Jessica Hay, told me after the announcement of the engagement that it was true. We all fancied Prince William. He was gorgeous. It's fair to say that it wasn't just Kate, but his picture was on the wall. And then she lied about it in the engagement interview. So that's interesting, like what, what's true there. I also don't like this part where we start talking about Kate as a teenager and the book is trying to convince us that she was not like one of those girls. She wasn't promiscuous. It says specifically, quote, Kate may have gossiped with her friends about the boys she fancied, but her attitude to sex was by all accounts very old fashioned. Like, listen, you don't have to like convince me that Kate was a virgin or something when she met William. Like, it's just very old fashioned of the book to even bring this up. And it's just creepy in general to talk about a teenager in this way and to talk about their sex lives. Like, 
Hello? Another weird part about Kate being interested in William before they met is this part where it says, a school source said, quote, she called it her kismet picture. This picture that she took where they were both in the same place at some point. She called it her kismet picture because she truly believed fate would bring them together. Some of the girls thought it was a dream, but who is deluded now? She's got her man, so maybe there was something in it. Uh, yeah, maybe there was something in it. Maybe she stalked him. <laughs> maybe she was stalking him because she had this crush on him. But then it's also weird because he's in a position of power over her. Like, the whole thing sounds messed up when you lay out all these details. Another great part, which is interesting in that they don't, try to refute this at all. They don't try to bring any evidence against this claim, but we have, quote, accusations would follow that Carol, Kate's mother, would engineer Kate's choice of university with the express purpose of seeing her daughter beguile, then ensnare a future king, a charge that was wholly inaccurate, but one that stuck. And then we get no evidence that that is inaccurate at all, which is bizarre. Like why put this claim in the book? if you are not actually going to back up that it's inaccurate with any evidence whatsoever. Like you're just basically telling me not to believe it, but you're not giving me a reason why I shouldn't believe it, which is sus. And last but not least for this chapter, we get this interesting discussion where it says that William was originally expected to attend Trinity College, Cambridge, but that he, quote, had decided to eschew tradition and instead go to St. Andrews, which filling in the pieces where he actually wanted to go to Edinburgh, it, it's it's unclear here. Like, was, was the family pushing him to go to Cambridge and he really wanted to go to Edinburgh, so they compromised and then he decided to go to St. Andrews? Like, that makes a little bit more sense with the timeline then he was like, no, I really want to go to St. Andrews, which that, that doesn't add up with anything else we know. But they have to embellish and say, quote, he had followed his gut instinct. He plumped for the small coastal town that would, he believed, allow him a level of privacy that a Southern university might not. At the same time, Kate Middleton was anxiously awaiting news of whether her application to her university of choice had been successful. Her university of choice was Edinburgh, though, so I, I don't know, uh, that that seems like a lie in the text. She was every bit as set on her course as William was on his, and it was a course that would lead to a chance meeting with a prince that she had for so long only dreamed of. Except William wasn't set on that course because he then changed his mind and took geography instead of art history. So again, the fluffing up of this part of the story is just really interesting to me. Like in 2014, why were they still not able to admit that William and Kate did not want to go to St. Andrews, either of them? You know, this timeline is going to get way messier in this book, right? <laughs> Part three, Prince William's childhood is still very sad, but royal biographers would kindly like you to forget that reality. I've done a lot of looking into Prince William because I thought how sad it was that he was turned into a teen idol as a child against his wishes and how that behavior from his family, staff, and the press is really not okay. Well, imagine my surprise when Robert Jobson's next chapter was entitled Teen Idol. Oh boy, I have thoughts. What a horrifying first paragraph. There was no great ambition behind the trip. It was another of the family skiing holiday. Some much needed time for the princes William and Harry to spend with their father just seven months after the appalling loss of their mother. Before the three princes retreated to Whistler and the mountains of British Columbia to enjoy four days on the slopes, a stint of royal walkabouts had been penciled in for the entourage on arrival in Canada. What a list of poor behavior. Ignoring that two children are grieving their mother seven months after the event, the fact that they go on a skiing trip purely for stupid PR, and that they use the children to perform some sort of political theater for the Commonwealth. He then even explains how the family capitalized on the public's emotions surrounding Diana to use her children as props in this ludicrous pageantry. Meanwhile, the very mention of his 
grieving sons prompted outpourings of public sympathy and heavy doses of galling grief by proxy. This comes right after a paragraph where Charles realizes that he's getting really bad PR because of Princess Diana's death. They just put it straight in print. They needed a way to distract from the fact that everybody hated Charles, so they paraded out these boys at every opportunity because they knew that the public was emotionally invested in them. And then the book floats into a crazy, toxic media fever dream. There were about 30 or so of us in the press contingent that had traveled to Canada, photographers, reporters, and television crews alike. If truth be told, it caught us all in the hop, but it was a dream story. The copy just flowed. My erstwhile colleagues, Richard Kay, Charles Ray, and I rushed around gleaning quotes and scribbling notes and filing reams of information for our newspapers back home. We knew that we were literally witnessing the making of a royal icon. It doesn't sound like you were witnessing. It sounds like you were creating. What a despicable quote here. As the adrenaline pumped through our reporter's veins, it was easy to forget that William, this tall, athletically handsome young man, was still just a boy, a teenager, having to deal with the weight of so much expectation. It would have been all too easy to dismiss his acute embarrassment were it not for the fact that William, revealing a determined streak of character, made sure that the press and his advisors were well aware of it. Not just easy to forget, but it sounds like you yourself are forgetting it. Ignoring the wishes of this child. Part four of talking about the story of the future king of Great Britain. Finally, the Canadian teenagers. When we last left Jobson's flowing copy, we heard bonkers stuff coming out of an adult's mouth, talking about following a child around for his entire life. But also now we know where the Canadian teenager story came from. If you follow me, you should know this story comes up in every biography. And I now suspect that it was this press pack that kind of fanned the flames of this weird teen heartthrob media story about Prince William. William does everything in his power to convey to people that he does not like this kind of attention. At first, he did his best to hide his discomfort at the extreme adulation with which he was met. He hated every second of it, as we were soon to find out. And then, bam! right at the top of a page. At first, both Harry and William seemed appalled by the phenomenon. Harry's nonplussed appearance was perhaps more to do with the fact that the girls' fans were not screaming for him. Sure, okay. William was just horrified at the heaving mass of adoration. Who in the family business is actually taking these children's thoughts into consideration? That this kind of attention would be embarrassing and upsetting and overwhelming for two teenagers to handle. The poor lad did not know which way to look. Eyes downcast, his bashful smile redolent of his late mother, William did his best and showed great resolve. One observer reported that he looked close to tears I did not see that and I was pretty close to the action, but the young prince's discomfort was obvious. And the royal family is a child welfare issue at this point. There are children being used as marketing tools for this teen girl audience that they're manipulating with these in journalists, so-called journalists who are there reporting on the action like Robert Jobson. And there is nobody in that family or institution that is taking these children's welfare into consideration, listening to children, and in advocating for what's best for them. He could not wait to get inside. And when he did, and only his father and the entourage were in earshot, all hell broke loose. William had had enough. He refused to go on. The task of talking William down from the ledge fell to his anxious father, who with a grace and diplomacy of which many believe him incapable, coaxed the petulant teen back from the brink. This is not a petulant teenager. This is a child actor refusing to perform because he's uncomfortable. The end. End of story. Why pressure two children to just be objectified in this way? Just to sell some bizarre fantasy about the beautiful, magical life inside Buckingham Palace. Somehow in all of this, a columnist for the Daily Express expresses a pretty good point. Would Diana's sons, if she were alive today, 
want her elder son to start carrying out royal duties at such a tender age. And keep in mind, this is like seven months after her death. And this paragraph is so defensive. The implication was that she would not. The finger of blame pointed at Charles, not for the first time, and also at his officials for exploiting Diana's sons. As would often happen in the years following Diana's death, Charles's critics would conveniently overlook the simple fact that despite scurrilous, untrue rumors relating to Harry's parentage, why are you bringing that up? The boys were both his sons too. He loved them unconditionally and would do anything to protect them. Still, it was a difficult situation. How could the princes visit a country which, as a realm and part of the Commonwealth, William would one day be king and yet still hide away from an adoring public? There we go again, conflating this idea of teenage Canadian girls being interested in Prince William for some reason, because they think he's cute or whatever, and making that sound like it has anything to do with, like, being the king of a nation, like the Commonwealth. Moreover, how could they even begin to control, never mind quash, such a spontaneous outpouring of affection for William? Something tells me it was not that spontaneous. It was too big an ask. The genie was out of the bottle, and not even an accomplished media fixer like Mark Boland could put it back and seal up the stopper. Besides, the emergence of William as the new royal star was not without its benefits for the family. Once he had embraced the situation, with his initial nerves and translucent soothed, the actor in William emerged. Maybe, just maybe, he was beginning to enjoy this. I swear to God, it's true. All of these royal biographies are horror novels. This paragraph reads as breathless, as well as morally reprehensible. This is essentially OG family blogging. Instead of pointing the iPhone at a bunch of kids and putting it on the internet, you're just getting the press and paparazzi to fly around and do it for you. Why did these people admit to these things in print? 